morning. Let's stand together, please, and sing. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, 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 grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Seated, please, and we have a short video to show you. In my darkness, I remember Mama's words reoccur to me. Surrender to the good Lord, and to wipe your slate clean. Take me to your river. But succinct to the point. Last time we had a baptism service here was on Easter Sunday. What a tremendous day that was. And our next baptisms are going to be uh, in the lake. We're not going to be freezing people. We're not going for a polar bear baptism this time. This time we're going to have a summer baptism at Lake Cocoa at our family uh, picnic on July, June the 25th. So if you are interested in being baptized, can you please make sure you connect with Pastor Matt over the next little while, because we have baptisms coming up on uh, June the 25th at, uh, at Camp Cockawa there on the uh, family uh, picnic day. So that'll be great. My name is Mark, and it is really great to see you here this uh, Sunday morning. I think summer has arrived. So I look around, I look at the colors, I look at where people are. 
This is my attempt at summer. Anybody got shorts on this morning? Oh, I see shorts. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> summer has arrived, and it's great to see you all in summer gear this morning. And thank you for coming here and not just staying out in the sun. It's great. Let's, as we come together in worship, let's make sure we give God all the glory and all the honor and all the praise as we worship him this morning. As I look around here, we talk about missionaries. Now is the time we send people out. Tony, great to have you back. <laughs> all the way back from the UK. <laughs> Thanks for being here this morning, Tony, and, uh, and Greg for press ganging him into doing some work. Yeah. Where's Michaela? Oh, she's doing children's. Oh, that's good. I'm pleased she's working as well. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So, as you know, Tony and Michaela, so Michaela was our, uh, um, she looked after children's ministry during Pastor Anna's uh, maternity leave, and Tony and Michaela left uh, Chilliwack uh, after being very, very heavily involved with us to go to the UK, and Tony is studying a PhD out in, uh, in the UK at the moment, but he's back here. I'm pleased to see you at work. Good. <laughs> that's good. Okay, as I say, my name is Mark, and it really is good to see you here this morning in, in, in church as we worship God. A few announcements this morning. Um, next, uh, coming down the track here, next Sunday we have Oasis service, and I already mentioned Camp Cockawa. And next Sunday, we're going to be focusing on the ministry of Camp Cockawa, and we have the camp director, Wayne Stewart, will be here with us uh, to share about what's happening at Cockawa. That camp has really grown in leaps and bounds over the last few years. It uh, went through a, 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 a tough time, but it really is moving back into a strong, strong position there. And uh, it's great that we can support the camp, and we're doing all we can to be there. And uh, please come out next week to listen to Wayne Stewart and hear about what's happening uh, at, camp Co Co I my teeth in, at Camp Cockawa. The following week after that, June the 4th, we've got our second uh, worship cafe. This is a time for extended contemporary worship. And uh, it's a time when we can come out and, and really praise God uh, and sing many you know, strong contemporary songs for an extended period of time. And we will allow Pastor Matt yeah, a few minutes to come and share God's word. Oh, yeah. uh, but it's really mainly Greg and Shani will be leading us in, in worship there. So if you didn't come to the last one, June the 4th is our next worship cafe. All right. Well, you've been sitting for a little while. Now it's time to stand up. Greet one another. Greet those around you. And then we're going to go into a time of song worship. All right, if we could kind of come back together here, we're going to read a scripture together as congregation in response by the leader. So let's, let's read scripture together now, please. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us to who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe.
Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the debt being erased. Thank you, God, at work in our lives even today. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Take my hand, won't you lead me closer? Lord, I need to be to And may that be our prayer this morning as we come close to Christ, as we surrender all at the foot of his cross. No matter what we're carrying, no matter where we are, do we surrender all to Christ and we're going to meet him there. Please be seated. And ushers, if you could join me at the front now, I'd appreciate that. Isn't it good as we come into God's presence and we sing our praises to him, we open up our hearts to him and allow his Holy Spirit to reign within us. When we come to church, it's so important that we allow God's Holy Spirit to truly fill our hearts so that we can feel his presence. Remember when Jesus went into the desert, he was tempted by the devil. He was full of the Holy Spirit. But when he left, he left with the power of the Holy Spirit. May we leave this place today with the power of the Holy Spirit radiating within us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this lovely sunny day. We give you thanks that we're able to live in this beautiful part of the world. Lord, we are so blessed. Lord, help us to do the best we can to be good stewards of everything we have with our time, with our talents, with our monies. And Lord, as we receive this offering now, I pray, Lord, that we will all give with a cheerful heart and the monies given will be used wisely to advance your kingdom, to help your church to grow, that it may multiply and many, many people may come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. So we commit this time and this offering to you now. In your name I pray. Amen. And at this time, children, you are dismissed to go to uh, Kids Church and go and see Michaela. And uh, I think Tony might even have gone up there as well. Uh, so children, you're dismissed for that. And uh, Glenn's going to lead us in our offering this morning.
Well, thanks, Glenn. I could feel that all the way, all the way. <laughs> um, if I could get um, the Quebec team, Nick, Leora, and Annette, if you could join me up on the stage, that'd be great. Um, welcome, Video Cafe. We're glad that you're here. Um, I just wanted to, before we um, send these guys off, the, everybody that's going to be up on the stage is, is heading out on summer missions, and we want to make sure that we're doing our part in sending them off and praying for them, so we'll do that in a minute. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you guys a quick update on Don and Betty Orr. Uh, many of you may have already read in the bulletin, there's an insert in there, about some change in ministry plans, which is really exciting for them. They've been serving for about 20 years in Poland in various church-related or church-planting-related ministries. And God knocked on their door and offered them a new opportunity, and they took, you know, time to pray and think through that and, and, um, and said yes. So they are going to be joining... Um, a new work that the CMA is involved in, in in the Desert Sands area. The specific information is in uh, is in the bulletin. I don't want to say too much because it's it's a very protected area. It's a creative access nations um, area that they're going to. They're working with a people group who are just coming to to know and understand Christ uh, for the first time. Um, so we're really excited to be supporting them. There's some contact information, um, again, on that insert that please take advantage of and, and send them your best wishes. Send them encouragement as they transition. They're hopefully going to be coming back and relocating in Canada um, the middle, of, or sorry, middle of February sometime next year. Um, so we'll look forward to hosting them until they, um, until they move to their, to their new location. So just so you know that that's what's up. Um, I'm really excited. Um, hi, hey, I'm standing in front of everybody here. I'm really excited because all these people are going out um, for the summer slash next week. And um, next week the, is, is our Quebec team going out. Hey, nice blue shirts. Kevin Hageman is also going, but he is leading a praise and worship time at, at Coquitlam Alliance, so he's not able to be here today. But we got Wayne here, Lynn, Diane, Katrina, and Mr. Alex and his faithful little pen. So they're gonna go and they're helping um, our friends in Ramuski host the district conference as well as doing some elder mentorship and some VBS and parish ministry envisioning. So we're really excited about this group of people. And if you have a chance, you should ask them why they're going because they're going for the right reasons. And these are the kind of people that we need to be sending. And, and I'm super excited that they're a part of our church and that they're serving in this capacity. We've got Annette and Leora there at the end and they are riding their bikes to Halifax. Yeah, yeah, you should clap for that. Um, they've been training, um, they're working with Partner Worldwide and World Renew um, to raise money to help advocate, um, help start up small businesses, just create awareness for people in severely impoverished nations. So they're, they're riding and we need, to, we need to be praying for them. And this, is, this here is Nick, he's one of our young adults, and he's going on our role servants trip this summer to Nepal, and he's going to be um, a small group leader for a couple of guys, and he's going to be engaging in ministry also with the Nepali people. So there's just lots of really cool stuff going on, and we're going to pray for them. So bow your heads. <laughs> Father, thanks. Uh, thanks for today. Uh, thanks that we get to send people out. Thank you that that we are people who don't just think about what we believe, but that we do what we believe. And for our Quebec team, we're grateful that they are going to, to work alongside of a church that needs encouragement. Um, they have got lovely people there, but they need encouragement, and they need help, and they need friendship, and they need, they just need support. And God, we can give that to them. And so I would pray that you would bless this team as they travel, as they stay with their billets, uh, I would pray for really good relationships, the beginnings of, of good relationships. And Lord, may they serve well. May they still they be healthy. They get the rest that they need to be able to do what you have called them to do. Uh, for Leora and Annette, Lord, what an amazing opportunity to converse with people about the things that you are doing in the world, um, things that need to be done, and how people can engage with that. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give them safety on the roads. Um, that you would give them the endurance and the perseverance and the mental strength, Lord, strengthen them in their innermost being like you do and, and give them all that they need to finish this well. And for Nick, as he leads and, and guides uh, a couple young men on his team and as he interacts with the Nepali people, I would pray that you would give him patience and love and grace and all that he needs to be able to see more of you and share more of you this summer. So God, we are grateful for all of these people. We are grateful that we 
can go. And Lord, we do. We just ask your blessing on, on my friends on the stage. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to mention, because I forgot. I didn't write it down. Um, but Lynn made this quilt, and she's going to be giving it to um, our friends at La Maison de Montpere. And we had a slide, but, you know, we don't need it because, oh, we do. Okay, everybody look. Oh, okay, look at this because this is what the windows actually look like in the church that was, that was renovated. Like, it looks exactly like this. So, Lynn, wave your hand. That's Lynn. Um, she made this, and, I mean, it's beautiful. It's our gift. It's our gift um, to them. So, that's gorgeous. We could see the screen, but you can't apparently see <laughs> the other way around. We um, also have our own, very own Pastor Holly Duke is also going out uh, on a missions trip this summer. She's going to be leaving uh, in next week. She's going out for uh, 12 weeks. She's going to be going to China. She's, this will be the 12th time she's been to China, and she's led teams there. Um, when Holly goes, she goes and she trains leaders and helps them to be effective in the field and then leads a team herself out in, in China. So uh, uh, Pastor Holly will be uh, leaving and be back with us in early August. So let's uh, pray for Pastor Holly as well. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks. We give you thanks specifically for Holly. We thank you that you've created her to be the godly woman that she is, with a real heart for, for people and a real heart for those lost. I pray, Lord, that as she goes out to China, you'll protect her, you'll look after her, you'll guide her, your Holy Spirit will truly reign through her, and that as she leads, may she lead way beyond her own ability, and that many, many people will come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Many of the young people that she's leading, may they come to a deeper, loving relationship with you. So, Father, look after her, protect her, and guide her, and bring her back to us safely. In your name I ask. Amen. Okay. And then also, we've got a group on a pilgrimage. So we've got all these going out on a missions trip in the near future. We also have a group on a pilgrimage at the moment. We've got uh, 12 of our own people, including Pastor Leon, are in Israel at the moment, uh, walking where Jesus walked and learning and l a lot about history. And uh, I'm sure they're going to come up with awe-inspired uh, stories to share with us. It is my honor and privilege this morning to, uh, to introduce to you our speaker. Our speaker is, uh, has been here before, and that's uh, the Reverend John Morrison. So John's going to come and share God's Word with us this morning. And um, please, you know, really resonate with him. John's a, a, a very vibrant speaker, and I've heard him a number of times. He's a good friend of Chris Thronis's. We won't hold that against him. Uh, but uh, welcome, John, and uh, we'll leave you to share God's Word Thanks, this morning. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Was that because I've survived my friendship with Chris for over 12 years now? Anyways, hey, it's wonderful to be back here. Uh, really thankful to get invited back. Uh, anytime you speak somewhere and get invited back, I don't know if you're doing a good job or a bad job. They tell me you should always preach like you never want to be invited back. And then to get invited back, does that mean I'm doing a good enough job? I don't know. But I love coming to Chilliwack Alliance because this is where God touched my heart uh, in that kind of time in life. I was grade 8. It was 1995, and you guys were hosting a conference for a bunch of junior high students uh, with the Alliance. So I came from North Shore Alliance on a bus over here, and I was sitting just around there. We were running all around the place and exploring, and then when the speaker came, there was a night. It was Saturday night, and they had a somewhat of an altar call thing. I came forward and said, God, I, I want you to use my life in some kind of way. It was that transition time in my life when I could have followed what my friends were doing as we were starting high school together, or God, where God was calling me, and it was at Chilliwack Alliance Church. So thank you to those of you who put on that conference, who volunteered your homes. I might have stayed in one of your homes with one of the billet kids. Sorry for any damages incurred to you during that time, but it's a privilege to come back and, and maybe try to make up some of it. So I, I bring you greetings on behalf of my family. We are here somewhere. They're running around. My, my daughter is a toddler, so my wife is chasing her around. We have another newborn named Gracie. So I think we have a picture there. There they are. It seemed my friends were having a, a stupid name competition when it came to naming their kids. And so we just went with normal biblical names. I thought of, uh, you know, well, they would say, you know, stuff like, a baby was born and it's healthy. It has 10 toes and 10 fingers. And then we named it Harpsichord <laughs> or Tiger Lily or something silly. 
And I thought, really, just is that all you're going to pray about for your kid? Like 10 fingers and 10 toes? You've got to be more specific than that, I think. So we gave uh, them biblical names uh, that would hopefully reflect the kind of life they would live. So we called the first one Abigail, which means father's joy. And she has lived up to that so far as well. She's been a joy, and, and I hope that she will continue to be a joy even through her teenage and young adult years. And when she starts dating at the age of 34 or something around those. <laughs> and then we have baby Grace, and she is a, a gift, God's unmerited favor. We don't deserve to have a beautiful family, but God has graciously given that to me. And so we're here uh, to serve you in some way. I also want to just thank my wife, Haley, who lets me do stuff like this as a hobby. So she kind of comes out of her comfort zone and uh, lets me speak at places. And uh, she is just a, a gift of God's grace to me. And so we are all here excited to, uh, to preach this morning and uh, to help out Pastor Leon, who I respect such a great deal. He is a, a, a true leader, a stable leader, a man of God, and one that I, as a young leader, respect so much. So I'm happy to help him while he's... Uh, gallivanting around the, the Near East somewhere. And then there's the rest of us, right? May long weekend, and here we are in church. Jesus said that the poor you will have with you always. <laughs> and it seems that was fitting for a crowd such as this in the morning. I want to say hi to a Chilliwack Alliance person that I don't know. I never, uh, I mean, maybe I know in some way, but Joshua was a, a student here who got baptized, and I got a, a message, a Facebook message from my friend Holly Duke, who said there was a guy at, from Chilliwack Alliance who got baptized recently, and he was at Camp Quanos when you were speaking there, and he saw one of your cartoons, and apparently God got a hold of him through your ministry, and he mentioned one of your cartoons in his uh, testimony, so keep up the good drawing. And I was like, wow, that's great, that's never happened before, a cartoon that led to a baptism. But it was cool. So Joshua, if you were there or if you were in the cafe, uh, hello. And this one is for you. It's a story about a sea captain. It's called uh, Never, that F Never Too Far-Fetched. Sea captain, can I get a name for the captain, by the way? How Leon. How about Captain Leon? Why, not, why don't we just call him that? Not related to any other people of the same name that we would know. But he and his assistant were out looking on the open waters and, they, you know, kind of surveying for danger. And they saw this pirate ship ahead. And, oh, no, that meant conflict was coming. So uh, Leon looked over at his assistant, and he would call him Smeed because good sea captain assistants are called Smeed. He said, there's a, there's a battle coming, Smeed. Fetch me my red shirt. So Smeed said, as a good, you know, he's just obeying orders, listened to what the captain said, went and grabbed the captain his red shirt. And he said, now I need to address the men. Assemble all the men. So all the men of the ship gathered, and he gave a very inspiring speech, saying, men, we have a battle coming. These pirates are going to be ruthless. We need to be strong. We need to be brave. We need to be bold. And we need to fight them, and we need to win the day here, or they will take everything. So the men got all riled up. They gave a big cheer, like you see in some of our favorite movies. They got a cheer, and they beat the pirates. After sailing for a few more days, they needed to get to land, and they found this island there, and they thought, this is an island where we can get resources, we can get resupply, we can rest a bit. But it is full of red-eyed wolves. They knew that there was conflict coming again, and so the captain looked to his assistant and said, Smeed, fetch me my red shirt. So Smeed went and got his red shirt, and the captain stood before the men once again and said, Men, we need to rest, we need, uh, we need to resupply, but we need to take this island of wolves first. So I need you to summon up your courage, summon up your strength, and we need to defeat these guys. And so they fought bravely and boldly once again that day with their last bit of energy. They defeated all the wolves on the island, and finally they were able to rest. Set up camp there, and the captain was sleeping when all of a sudden a snake bit him. A snake bit him and he quickly he nudged his assistant and said, Smeed, Smeed, fetch me my red shirt. And so he, the Smeed says, you know, sir, I mean, in the quiet of the moment, I've been serving you faithfully for all these years. Finally, we're getting some rest. And now I need to fetch you your red shirt at a time when you need medical assistance. Why the red shirt, sir? He said, Smeed, let me tell you, the margin of error and between a win and a loss is so small if our men were to be discouraged, if they were to be uh, scared in any kind of way, if they were to see me as a leader with any kind of chink in my armor, I need, I, I, they, that would not be uh, helpful. We might lose, and we would lose it all. So fetch me my red shirt. 
Just at that moment, they heard this blood-curdling rawr coming over the mountains, booming through the whole island. And this huge monster, the likes of which they had never seen in all their voyages ever before, came over and cast a shadow over their entire camp. To which case, Captain Leon looked over at his assistant and said, Smeed, fetch me my brown pants. <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to tell that one in church. <laughs> but it is appropriate for our message this morning. The Apostle Paul was a leader. He was a church planter who went into a city known notoriously as a booming uh, city that was full of industry, full of uh, people just living however they wanted to living lives that did not honor God, that did not honor the one true God, Jesus Christ. And Paul said, these people need to know Jesus. I mean, sure, their economy is great, and sure, their families might be doing well, and they're, they're known as a growing, beautiful city, but they need Jesus first and foremost. And so he goes into Corinth, and he starts telling people about Jesus. And people respond. He's the leader, Paul is. And, they, and he, it seems like everything he says, they're, they're, they're living on, they're, they're just soaking it all up. They accept Jesus. They want to follow Jesus. But they still have friends and family members who are still living the old way, still with the old values, with worshiping other gods as the center of their lives and culture that does not honor Jesus. And so how do they live with this tension? Sometimes they would look to Paul and say, Paul, how do we do it? How do we live this life? How, we're, we're not strong enough. But sometimes Paul would go into other cities and he would uh, tell other people about Jesus. Thessalonica and Philippi. He had a message to share and he wanted everybody to know about that. And so Paul wasn't always there to answer their questions. But there was other leaders. Other leaders that didn't always tell them the right answers. Got them off a bit. Even questioned Paul's authority. Paul's not the best leader. Have you heard about these leaders? Paul's not even the best speaker. I mean, look at the Roman speakers. Look how strong they are. They don't um, they don't ah, they don't stutter. Their voices boom. Paul comes to you in weakness, sometimes limping, because he's been beaten up so many times. His eyesight, we, we think, might not have been so great. Paul was nothing like the great speakers, the great leaders that Rome knew about, was famous for. And so Paul had to defend himself often. And he would write these letters from these other churches that he was at. And one of the letters we have is a letter to the Corinthians. I was assigned uh, chapter 4, verse 8 to 21. And like, I'd like to read that to you, thinking about this context. What is Paul addressing? He's addressing a group of people that aren't sure if he's the best leader for the job. Because they have these old ideas of what it was like to, uh, to truly follow a leader. He's nothing like the Caesars, nothing like the governors, nothing like the sophists, the great public speakers of their Roman culture. So why should they follow him? Let's read, uh, starting in verse 8. Forgive me, I'm reading from the, the ESV here, so it might be a little bit different than your translation, but it'll be largely the same. Paul is writing with a sarcastic tone. You kind of have to hear that. There's, uh, don't you wish there was a sarcastic font, right? Whenever you're making a joke on a text or writing on somebody's wall or whatever, co commenting on their pictures, which I know many of you are doing uh, even as we speak here. Just kidding. That's what the video cafe is for, right? They do that over there. No offense, guys. I, I don't mean it. I got to read. But you got you to read this with a bit of a sarcastic tone because what Paul is doing is he's defending himself and he's kind of making fun of, of their culture as well. This is what he says. Already you, Corinthians, have all you want. Already you've become rich. Without us, you've become kings. And would, we, would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless. And we labor, working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. 
I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. As I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will soon come to you, if the Lord wills. And I will find out the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? There's clearly a problem that, that Paul is addressing. You can, you can see the sarcasm. It's just dripping as he contrasts his experience with what he knows about how things are done in God's kingdom versus the way that the Corinthians see the world through the eyes of the Roman culture and the, the kingdom of Rome. See, Christianity is a relationship with God. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus saves sinners. But it's not just a relationship with God. Christianity is also a completely different way of seeing the world. Christianity tells us what things are important, what things are worth fighting for, what things are wrong and should be avoided, what things are right and should be pursued. Christianity is a worldview. And while I don't doubt that the church in Corinth, there was many people who loved Jesus, that honored him, that attended church regularly, that really truly wanted to know the truth, but they hadn't had the fullness of the Christian worldview. And that takes time. Remember, they were coming from a, a very, what do you say, opposite of Christian, unchristian culture. I mean, and I've heard Pastor Leon talking about the Corinthian culture. You know what that's about. If you haven't, you can listen to previous messages as he's telling you about what it was like. But to come and then become a Christian is not to say, oh, all of a sudden I get it all. It takes time. And thankfully, Paul took the time to love and shepherd the people with his authority as an apostle of Jesus, to give them the truth of how things are, how things truly, or what things truly matter. I, I, I have sympathy for the Corinthians, because they don't quite get it. The culture that they came from valued power, prestige, and pageantry. The power that they loved was being in control. If you have the title, then you are the top dog. You have all the power. You can, with the turn of your thumb, ex- have someone executed. You can uh, make a decree, and everybody across the known world has to live that way. And those are the people that they looked up to. The ones who flaunted that kind of power were paraded in the streets and demanded the execution of anybody who failed to comply in honoring them as they were. Rome loved the prestige to be noticed, to be seen at the right places, to be seen with the right people, and to show the pageantry of how much you have. All of a sudden, Paul comes along and he starts saying, no, those things don't matter. That God's not impressed with your accolades. God's not impressed with your titles. God sees past all that. He's looking into the heart, and the kind of heart that he wants is not a proud heart, but a humble heart, a contrite heart. Someone who's not listening to themselves and boasting about how great they are, but someone who's listening to the still, small voice of God and boasting about how great he is. That's the kind of thing that God is after. And we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, and we see that's exactly the kind of kingdom that Jesus was setting up. Based on you've heard it said this, but I say to you this, something else. Christianity is about admitting that God is in control, that we are a part of his great plan. It's about humbling yourself before him. To the Romans, they wouldn't have got that. These Corinthians would have uh, seen, you're centering this whole worldview, everything you believe around some itinerant, homeless, Galilean peasant in Jerusalem, some outskirts of some Roman colony? That's who you're following? That's who you're giving your life to? This is sheer foolishness. This is weakness on display. He was a criminal, that Jesus that you talk about. We kill criminals on crosses. Why would you consider this to be the power of God, this great act and display of weakness? 
If Jesus was to be worshiped, he should be like our Caesars, who have all the power. But here he is submitting his power, apparently, and dying. That's why Paul says this is a foolish message. The cross makes no sense unless you embrace the Christian worldview and realize that this truly is the power of God and it is nothing like the way this world uses power. The Corinthians couldn't figure out, well, who, who should our leader be? Who are we ultimately following? This Paul who seems to be ha happy about his weaknesses, boasting even about them. This Paul who's living this uh, contrasting life. We see contrast throughout this text. Paul says, you are kings. And it's interesting, these, these Corinthians probably had never seen a king before. They just had an idea of what a king is like. Paul says, you are kings, sure. Well, we are like prisoners awaiting execution. Verse 9. Rome was very famous for when they had conquered a new land, they would bring the slaves along the main road. Or they, they brought the, sorry, the soldiers and turned them into slaves and paraded them in chains along the road. And many of them would go towards their execution and many of them would go towards a life of slavery. But what Rome wanted to showcase was that we had just conquered another nation. We had just advanced the kingdom of Rome again. And so we're going to put these def defeated ones on display for all to see. That this is what happens when you don't obey Rome. Paul says, if I could borrow an analogy of what it's like to be a Christian, particularly a Christian leader, particularly a leader in a place like Corinth, that's what I'm like. I'm like the defeated foe that's now on display. And it's actually God himself who's leading that procession. Isn't that interesting? That that's how God uses people in his kingdom. Some he gives titles to, but some he does not. And some have to go through great weakness and defeat, and that's how God shows his power through them. It's totally different than the way our world works. Paul says, when, when we're mistreated, we bless. When you're reviled in Rome, Rome executes. But when, when Christians are, ex are, are uh, reviled, we bless our enemies. We pray for those who persecuted us just as Jesus did. That's not natural. That's not how the Corinthians would have understood how you deal with conflict and ad adversaries. When we are weak, we find our true strength, Paul says. When you're weak in Rome, you're discarded, left behind, ignored, insignificant. But Paul says that's when the Christian truly finds his stride his or her stride, is when they finally discover their own weakness and the strength that God can offer them. If you're one of Paul's friends, maybe even if you see Paul converting uh, in, and you're having, I was going to say Thanksgiving dinner, they didn't have Thanksgiving back then, you're having some feast and you hear about Paul who's got a great education, a Roman citizen, he's got all the accolades, of being truly something in that culture. And there he is renouncing it all to follow this Galilean peasant. you got to look at him and say, Paul, why are you doing this? Why are you giving everything up? You had it all. And yet here you are walking away. Paul, why are you embracing this seemingly countercultural, foolish message? Let me give you three points. Three points why I think that uh, Paul would say, I'm going to stick around with this, that I believe the good news of following Jesus and being a fool on display for him is far better than any other system that the world could offer, particularly the world that the Corinthians lived and breathed and, and knew about. The first thing that I see is that the gospel is generic. The gospel is generic. By that I don't mean bland, no name, Right? What I mean is that is generic means it's available for everybody. Applicable to anybody who wants it. Contrast that with, with Roman culture. And that says only the powerful can truly play. You have to have a, the, a noble birth. You have to have the right education. You have to speak in our language. have to understand our culture. You have to be a person of means to have the resources if you want to have a life of significance. You want to live a life that honors the gods, it starts by the family that you were born into, the stuff that you have. You think of little 
Theseus or something. Grows up and he says, I want to be, I want to be loved by the gods. I want to be seen by the gods. I want to be used by the gods. Some would say, you can't. You weren't born into the right family. You don't have enough money. You're not good looking enough. Little Theseus then buries his head and lives the rest of his life thinking that the gods don't care about him because he simply didn't have enough, didn't talk right, didn't come from the right family or understand the culture well enough. Christianity comes along, an evangelist comes and sees little Theseus as he's sitting in the corner thinking that his whole life is over and says, Theseus, it doesn't actually matter about all those external things that your culture has prized so much. It's your heart that God sees and that God knows because he made you and he loves it. And even though you've wandered away from him, he died on a cross, taking your rebellion against God. The things that you do in thought, word, and deed that you think have disqualified you from God. God came and died on the cross to save you from those things so that you could have a right relationship with God. And little Theseus, he wants to give you a new start. He gives you a gift. He actually lives inside of you and wants to walk with you. And he wants to use you in a way that you might never have thought you could be used by the one true God. Theseus didn't come from a great family or he didn't go to the right school. Didn't understand the culture, but God knew him. And God loved him. And Jesus died for him and has a plan for him. Why? Because the gospel is generic. It's available for all of us. And that's good news for us this morning, isn't it? See, we're probably well aware of of our own limitations. We see people of significance, and we think, well, I I could never be like that. We see somebody being used by God, and we think, oh, I couldn't do that. We see someone else going on a missions trip. We say, I would never be allowed to go on a missions trip. We think other people can be used by God, but not me. We see people standing on stage, and we see their highlight reels. We see them posting things online. We see the, the great things that God is apparently doing through them, all these achievements, family growing, a lifestyle things that are happening. We think, I could never have that. We think their life must be so good. We see their highlight reel, but all we see in ourselves is our behind-the-scenes brokenness. We know ourselves so well. And we think, there's darkness there that I don't want to tell anybody about. There's things I've done in my past I know because I'm backstage. I know what I'm really like, and God would never care about me. But the gospel says, no, that God does care about you. And that God can use you. He could even use someone like Paul, who was a notorious uh, murderer of, of Christians, or at least he arranged for the murder of Christians. And then God got a hold of his life and used him in a powerful way, as we've talked about. God can use anybody. And God can use us today. This is a, an interesting example. I don't know if you, it has nothing to do with God. Well, maybe it does, I'm not sure. But there was a guy named Carter Wilkin, Wilkerson. And I guess he was hungry for some chicken nuggets last week. And he just sent out, opened up his phone and sent out a little tweet. And he tweeted to Wendy's, the great restaurant chain. And he said, Wendy's, how many retweets to get a year of chicken nuggets? Wendy's uh, wrote back, 18 million. Well, that's a noble endeavor to try to think you can get 18 retweets. But he got one, and then he got two, three, four, and it went viral. And actually, he, got, he never made it to 18, Carter did it. But he actually got more tweets than any, or more retweets than anyone else in history, more than Ellen from uh, the Academy Awards that day. He, so this tweet actually is the most retweeted. Little Carter, somewhere in the States, opens up his phone, and now he's being talked about in even Chilliwack. Like, why are you even bothering about that? It just shows me that you never, in today's age, especially in the internet age, never overlook the underdog, the person without the right family, without the noble birth, without the education. God can use literally anybody today to get a message across the entire world. If a message about chicken nuggets can get spread across mainstream media, Who knows what God can do with the message that he's put inside of your heart this morning. That's just the way the world is today. Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses 500 years ago on the Wittenberg door, and in doing so, he enabled people to get to God. Well, he showed us that we could have the Bible in our own language. 
The Reformation opened up the Bible to get it in the hands of regular people. He said, you don't have to go to the church leaders to get to God. You can actually go straight to God through Jesus, the priesthood of all believers. Luther leveled the playing field with the incoming of the Reformation. I believe the internet has done something similar for us today. The internet has leveled the playing field so that we could all have a voice to honor God, to get a message out, to be used by him in some way that you never would have imagined you could before. It's because the gospel is generic. It's available to everyone and anybody can be a part of what God is doing. Second thing is that the gospel is grassroots. The gospel is grassroots. In Rome, the state was everything. People worshiped the gods of Rome. Rome was at the center of the economy. It was the center of the hope of the future. It was the salvation of the people. The state was all. And then Christianity comes along and says, you know what? God has a kingdom. And Rome is not it. God may use Rome, and he certainly did. But it's not everything. The church does not do well with that kind of power, with nation-state power. The kingdom of God in that first century, the, the kingdom that went from a, a handful of disciples around 12 to crowds of thousands, to then that which eventually turned the Roman Empire on its head by getting to about 300 million in just 400 years. The growth of that kingdom was built by slaves and martyrs and outcasts. The one that our culture had all but forgotten. Those are the people that God said, I'm going to use those kind. Lest you think that somebody with great talent, somebody with great wisdom, education, family lineage, born at the right place at the right time, just in case you would think that those were factors that I will build my kingdom on and give them credit. I'm going to completely flip that around and say I'm going to build this with the least of these, that they will be great in my kingdom, the ones who humble themselves, die to themselves. Those are the ones that I will use. The gospel is grassroots. Paul reflects on this in his, earlier in his letter, in chapter 1. He talks to the Corinthians, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Just in case you wanted to get all caught up in wisdom and great displays of power, God says, I'm going to shame those things. And I'm going to use the opposite. I'm going to use the foolish things. I'm going to use the weak things. That's how I build my kingdom. D.L. Moody was a great American preacher and evangelist. Lots, lots of influence, kind of was one of the fathers of, of the evangelical movement. This is what he says. He said, if this world is going to be reached, I am convinced that it must be done by men and women, I love this, of average talent. After all, there are comparatively few people in this world who have great talents. I love how he says there's just a few. I mean, Bob and Henry and Martha and Lydia, she was, they were all pretty good. I mean, that's what Paul says, right? Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise. Some of you are pretty wise. God bless you. For the rest of us, we need other things. We need to work. We need to, we need to try things. We need to fail sometimes. We need to stumble into our calling and watch God use these efforts. One of the things that my wife is so good at is teaching my daughter interesting things. Mostly things that interest my wife, she gets my daughter interested in, but coloring is one of them. And so she, uh, they'll take a picture, maybe a Minnie Mouse or something, and my daughter will just start scribbling all over it and uh, wrong colors outside of the lines. And it's just a, a big mess. And then my wife will come and take her crayons and she'll start coloring within the lines and she'll use my daughter's colors to kind of complement the colors that she needs or that the color, need, or sort of the paper needs. And by the end, you have this actually decent looking thing. And I know that there's two artists that contributed to this masterpiece. One is my daughter, who's two, who doesn't know how to color in the lines, but second is my wife, who I would argue is a master crayoner. And it's actually a pretty decent piece of art by the end of it. I think when I, when I saw that one time, I thought, you know what, I'm like my daughter, just kind of 
going out of the lines and trying my best and doing whatever I can and telling jokes about guys that soil themselves in my introduction. And God is somehow behind the scenes making it all work and as a part of his plan. And my prayer is that nobody would ever look at what I have done at the end of my life and say, wow, look at you, John. Look at your talent. Look at your abilities. They would say, wow, look at what God can do with such a wretch as you. The gospel is grassroots. God does not want to share his glory with any person. How about another story? Albert McMakin was a 24-year-old American farmer who had a radical experience with God. He was just a farm boy who all of a sudden saw that there was a bigger picture for his life. And so he had this truck. He said, oh God, I want to serve you. He heard about some revival meetings that were going on down the street. And so he had this big truck and he would just bring people back and forth, load as many people as you can. They're hanging off the truck. You know, and in those days you could get away with it. And he's just bringing people back and forth. You got to hear this preacher. You got to hear this good news. This is an amazing message. And day, day after day, night after night, he would just bring people, inviting his whole town to come and see there was this one guy that was a little resistant. He didn't want to go. He wanted to chase girls. Albert thought, how can I get this guy to come? He thought, he seems to be interested in my truck at least. Albert said, hey, I'm driving this truck back and forth. Would you like to drive my truck back and forth? I'll just sit in the passenger seat and I'll let you pick people up. And he goes, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. I could, I'll drive your truck, sure. One day he drove the truck and he started to hear the message that people were listening to. And he, he heard about Jesus and he, he said, that's a great thing. I, I actually need that in my life. That's far better. If this preacher is right, this is, far, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And that night, one night, he gave his life to Jesus. The driver of that truck that day that heard that message was Billy Graham. He became the, the greatest evangelist in, in history. We cannot all be like Billy Graham. But if you've got a truck, you can be like Albert McMakin. Because those are the kind of people that God likes to use. Paul was like one of those kinds of people. Comfortable with his weakness. Comfortable with his limitations. With his disabilities, his ailments. His finiteness as a human being. And God was using him. And that's what Paul was saying. Look. The gospel is like this. It's not like that which you've seen that you think this is what a leader has to look like. This is what somebody that's being used by God has to be like. It's totally different. It's grassroots. And finally, the gospel is grounding. It's generic, it's grassroots, and it's grounding. It's humbling. See, the gospel is good news, but to understand why we need good news, you also have to wrestle with the bad news first. The fact that we are not good enough on our own. If you think about our culture, it seems to be the opposite of that. It starts off by saying, you know, you have something inside of you that you need to get out. And you should express that and become that and follow that with everything that you have. Pursue it. Let other people see it. Do whatever it takes. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise that what's inside of you is the most precious thing you have and you need to become that. Christianity is totally the opposite of that. It says there's something inside of you, but it's dark. It's what's driving your thoughts and your words and your deeds and those things that you would never want anybody to know. It needs to die because it's going to destroy you, it's going to destroy your relationships, and it's going to wreck you for eternity because it's going to turn you in on yourself and make you so infatuated with who you are. The gospel says God can heal that. But it first has to start with you admitting that it needs to go. That it's selfish and it's proud and it's resisting of God and it keeps people away. And it's all about you. And God didn't make us to, like that. He made us to be all about him. To love him, to honor him, to reflect his glory. So that he can do a work for this world that started inside of our hearts. Christianity is grounding because it tells us it's not about us. The world does not revolve around us. Our identity is not based on how many likes we have on the things that we post about. The gospel starts by saying, you need a savior for that darkness. And Jesus came to turn that darkness into light, to emanate that light to a world. Paul said, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
that Jesus died for sinners in which I am the worst. Paul was okay to say publicly to crowds in Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonians and to a little guy named Timothy that he was discipling, saying, it's not about me. In fact, if you want to know about me, God chose to use me to show that he is a gracious God, to show that he can use anybody if he could use a guy like Paul. That's what Jesus does. So my application for you this morning is just to have the courage to see the world like God sees it, which is the true world. The better way of seeing it. It's not exclusive. It's generic. It's not for the powerful. It's grassroots. And it's not for the proud. It's for the humble. Those are the ones who get to be used by God. As you go into a world that is very similar to Corinth, with similar values, similar cultures, similar things that we celebrate. I pray that you would have the courage to do it differently. To see the world as God sees it, as Jesus sees it. That you too, like Paul, would be a fool on display. I'm going to invite the worship team out, but I want to tell you one story. Knowing the opportunity of the internet that we can broadcast ideas all around the world, I was listening to uh, some podcasts, and they're just, you know, long diatribes or interviews or sermons or whatever it is. I listened to it when I was on the treadmill, when I was uh, cutting the grass or doing any stuff around the house or uh, sometimes driving. I listened to these things. I thought, I need to do one of these. Like, I could, I got some things that I want to say, and I got these friends I could interview. One of my first people I interviewed was Chris Thronis on what I call the John Morrison podcast. It sounds narcissistic to make it your name, but I thought that's probably the most humble thing I could call it because I know who I am well enough, and it's not like the most amazing podcast. It's not uh, the best of all podcasts. It's just me talking to my friends. I got the chance to interview just this last week a guy named Andrew Marcus. I don't know if you know Andrew, but he's a, he's a worship leader, and if you listen to Praise 106.5, his song, You Are With Me, has just uh, it's, it's gone bonkers. They're playing it all the time, as Praise 106.5 does, with songs that you like. And anyways, Andrew wrote this song, You Are With Me. And I just got to, I mean, it's, it's helped my, me and my family in a, in a tough season recently. And I just wanted to thank him. And I, I heard that the story was so interesting. The story is actually that Andrew was sitting at a church in Langley just a couple of years ago, maybe uh, seven to ten years ago. He's sitting there and, some, and the pastor says, if you want to be used by God in some kind of way, just put out your hands. You don't have to be a rock star. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to have a noble birth or whatever, be educated. You could just put out your hands and be available. Andrew was studying a, a post-secondary. Didn't even play music at the time. But put out his hands and felt God saying, I want you to start playing music. So he took guitar lessons after that day. Felt like God was leading him to start learning how to play. And he got mentored by a, a worship leader, pastor. Kind of took him under his wing. And then he started to one day just write songs, just write what was coming out of his, his heart. He, uh, he got, had a bad experience at a, at a church that he was at, and he was feeling sick and just having one of those awful nights. At two in the morning, he woke up, and he heard this, this song, In the Darkest Valley, in the Middle of the Raging Sea, When I'm in the Battle, Lord, You Are With Me. And he just pulled out his guitar at two in the morning and started playing it. And all of a sudden, God used that song to touch my life, maybe touch your life. But if you would look back at Andrew, not even 10 years ago, you'd say, I would never think that you, you know, studying biology or whatever he was studying, could be used by God in that way. He didn't come from the right city. Didn't, you don't, he didn't even play an instrument. And there God is putting this song on his heart and teaching him. Why? And Andrew would say, it's not because of me. It's not because I'm good enough, smart enough, talented enough. It's because God had a message to share and he wanted to use somebody like me. So maybe there's somebody here and God wants to use you in some way. Maybe there's somebody at Video Cafe that God wants to use. Maybe this is an opportunity where you could just put out your hands in some way. Maybe if you don't feel comfortable with that, well, put out your hands in your heart at least, right? And just say, God, would you, would you use somebody like me? I know you know what I've done. You know where I've come from. But if you are a gracious God as this young man is telling me, then maybe you could use me for something. I invite you to do that as the worship team sings. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your grace in my life. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to serve this church that has been so good to me in my past. I want to thank you for the lives that you are touching and the lives, Lord, in this community that you still want to touch. 
because you use regular people like us. Lord, we haven't honored you as we should. We haven't lived the lives that deserve to be used by you, the living God. And yet maybe you could use us in some way to accomplish your kingdom plans. But Lord, we're also well aware that this culture is antagonistic to that kind of stuff, that it will push back and call us fools and, and, it, and it won't always listen. But Lord, make us the kind of men and women who will have the kind of courage to live that way. And may many come to know you, Jesus, because of it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Let's all stand, please, and sing together. This is amazing grace. What a fantastic message we've heard this morning. Thank you, John, for sharing. have one seat for one second and can we thank the worship team i know greg just does a great job every week i don't know if you guys get applauded for a lot but i just thought what's a shameless plug for you
Hey, thanks so much for having me. I just want to give one bit of announcement quickly. I, if you want to keep this conversation going or if you know someone that needed to hear today's message, one, you can share it online because I know you guys do that. But two, uh, since I've been here last, I've written two books. One's called Clear Minds and Dirty Feet. It's an apologetics book all about reasons why I believe Christianity is true. Just kind of my journey to rebuilding my faith after I had some intense doubts in my young adult years. And then two is it called Life Hacks. It's just a book on navigating through the turbulent waters of Christian discipleship in the 21st century. So I'm happy to uh, give those to you, but I can't give them to you for free. I have to be $15 each. And so I promise you that the proceeds will go all towards needy children. They just happen to be my needy children. <laughs> and so I have to charge or else I'd love to give it I mean, away. Anyways, I'll be at the back if you just want to say hi. Uh, come do that. Say hi to my family. I think they'll be there as well. But just thank you so much for having us and God bless you. Let me close with the blessing that uh, Aaron was told to give to the people back in Numbers chapter 6. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you, Chilliwack Alliance Church. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you again one day.